After the election of Abraham Lincoln in November 1860, the United States possessed a sense of sectional tension that had not been felt before. The country had swayed back and forth, but now more and more states began to take secession seriously. South Carolina seceded on December 20th, and Mississippi left the Union on January 9th. The Union was being torn asunder. Welcome to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I want to pick up with the repercussions of secession for the House and the Senate. Congressmen left the chambers of government as their states left. One of those men was Jefferson Davis, a senator from Mississippi. He was born in Kentucky but made his fortune on his plantation in Mississippi. On January 21st, Davis delivered his farewell address to the Senate, where he addressed his position on secession. That is what I want to read to you today. It is known to senators who have served with me here that I have for many years advocated as an essential attribute of state sovereignty the right of a state to secede from the Union. Therefore, if I had not believed there was justifiable cause, if I had thought that Mississippi was acting without sufficient provocation or without an existing necessity, I should still, under my theory of the government, because of my allegiance to the state of which I am a citizen, have been bound to her action. I, however, may permit to say that I do think she has justifiable cause, and I approve of her act. I confer with her people before the act was taken, counseled them, then that if the state of things which they apprehended should exist when the convention met, they should take the action which they now have adopted. I hope none who hear me will confound this expression of mine with the advocacy of this right of a state to remain in the Union, and to disregard its constitutional obligations by the nullification of the law. Such is not my theory. Nullification and secession so often confounded are indeed antagonistic principles. Nullification is a remedy which it is sought to apply within the Union and against the agent of the states. It is only to be justified when the agent has violated this constitutional obligation and a state assuming to judge for itself denies the right of the agent thus to act and appeals to the other states of the Union for a decision. But when the states themselves and when the people of the states have so acted as to convince us that they will not regard our constitutional rights, then, and then for the first time, arises the doctrine of secession in its practical application. A great man now reposed with his fathers, and who has been often arraigned for a want of fealty to the Union, advocated the doctrine of nullification, because it preserved the Union. It was because of this deep-seated attachment to the Union, his determination to find some remedy for existing ill short of a severance of the ties which bound South Carolina to the other states, that Mr. John C. Calhoun advocated the doctrine of nullification, which he proclaimed to be peaceful, to be within the limits of state power, not to disturb the Union, but only to be a means of bringing the agent before the tribunal of the states for their judgment. Secession belongs to a different class of remedies. It is to be justified upon the basis that the states are sovereign, there was a time when none denied it. I hope the time may come again, when a better comprehension of the theory of our government and the inalienable rights of the people of the states will prevent anyone from denying that each state is a sovereign and thus may reclaim the grants which it has made to any agent whomsoever. I therefore say I concur in the action of the people of Mississippi, believing it to be necessary and proper, and should have been bound by their action if my belief had been otherwise. And this brings me to the important point which I wish on this last occasion to present to the Senate. It is by this confounding of nullification and secession that the name of a great man whose ashes now mingle with his mother earth has been invoked to justify coercion against the seceded states. The phrase to execute the laws was an expression which General Jackson applied to the case of a state refusing to obey the laws while yet a member of the Union. That is not the case which is now presented. The laws are to be executed over the United States and upon the people of the United States. They have no relation to any foreign country. It is a perversion of terms. At least it is a great misapprehension of the case, which cites that expression for application 
to a state which has withdrawn from the Union. You may make war on a foreign state, if it be the purpose of gentlemen that they make war against a state which has withdrawn from the Union, but there are no laws of the United States to be executed within the limits of a seceded state. A state finding herself in the condition in which Mississippi has judged she is, in which her safety requires that she should provide for the maintenance of her rights of the Union, surrenders all the benefits, and they are known to be many, deprives herself of the advantages, they are known to be great, severs all ties of affection, and they are close and enduring, which have bound her to the Union, and thus divesting herself of every benefit, taking upon herself every burden, she claims to be exempt from any power to execute the laws of the United States within her limits. I well remember an occasion when Massachusetts was arraigned before the bar of the Senate, and when the doctrine of coercion was rife and to be applied against her because of the rescue of a fugitive slave in Boston. My opinion then was the same that it is now, not in a spirit of egotism, but to show that I am not influenced in my opinion because the case is my own. I refer to that time and that occasion as containing the opinion which I then entertained and on which my present conduct is based. I then said if Massachusetts fallen through a stated line of conduct, chooses to take the last step which separates her from the Union, it is her right to go. I will neither vote one dollar nor one man to coerce her back, but will say to her, Godspeed, in memory of the kind association which once existed between her and the other states. It has been a conviction of pressing necessity it has been a belief that we are to be deprived in the union of the rights which our fathers bequeathed to us, which has brought Mississippi into her present decision. She has heard proclaim the theory that all men are created equal, and this made the basis of an attack upon her social institutions, and the sacred declaration of independence has been invoked to maintain the position of the equality of the races. The declaration of independence is to be construed by the circumstances and purposes for which it was made. The communities were declaring their independence. The people of those communities were asserting that no man was born, to use the language of Mr. Jefferson, booted and spurred to ride over the rest of mankind. That men were created equal, meaning the men of the political community. That there was no divine right to rule. That no man inherited the right to govern. That there was no classes by which the power and place descended to families but that all stations were equally within the grasp of each member of the body politic. These were the great principles they announced. These were the purposes for which they made their declaration. These were the ends to which their enunciation was directed. They have no reference to the slave, else how happened it that among the items of arraignment made against George III was that he endeavored to do just what the North has been endeavoring of late to do to stir up insurrection among our slaves. Had the Declaration announced that the blacks were free and equal, how was the prince to be arraigned for stirring up insurrection among them? And how was this to be enumerated among the high crimes which caused colonies to sever the connection with the mother country? When our Constitution was formed, the same idea was rendered more palpable, for there we find provision made for that very class of persons as property. They were not put upon the footing of equality with white men, not even upon that of paupers and convicts. But so far as representation was concerned, were discriminated against as a lower caste, only to be represented in the numerical proportion of three-fifths. I find in myself perhaps the type of the general feeling of my constituents towards yours. I am sure I feel no hostility to you. Senators from the North, I am sure there is not one of you, whatever sharp discussion there may have been between us, to whom I cannot say, in the presence of my God I wish you well. And such, I am sure, is the feeling of the people whom I represent towards those whom you represent. I therefore feel that I but express their desire when I say I hope, and they hope, for peaceful relations with you, though we must part. They may be mutually beneficial to us in the future, as they have been in the past, if you so will it. The reverse may bring disaster on every portion of the country, and if you will have it thus, we will invoke the God of our fathers, who delivered them from the power of the lion to protect us from the ravages of the bear, and thus putting our trust in God in our own firm hearts and strong arms, we will vindicate the right as best we may. 
I hope you enjoy the reading of Jefferson Davis's farewell address to the Senate. We see him invoke the differences of nullification and secession, which is critical to understanding why states left the Union. He and others believe that nullification pertained to states who remained in the Union. The nullification crisis that happened during Andrew Jackson's presidency resulted in Jackson asking and receiving from Congress the Force Act, which would give him the power to force South Carolina through military means to pay their taxes. Davis uses this to defend secession by saying that if the states were just attempting to nullify laws, the government could intervene. But since the states seceded, those states are basically foreign countries, which means that the laws of Congress have no power over them. Another important takeaway is in him talking about the government attacking their social institutions, which is another way to say slavery, by attempting to clarify the Declaration of Independence by saying that the statement, all men are created equal, does not apply to the races, but instead to things like royalty. I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay tuned for the Historical Newspapers episode coming out on Thursday, and I hope to have another video drop this weekend. Thank you all, and I'll see you soon.